Um, so while we've uh, involved ourselves in the Gospel of Luke, um, at the outset of almost every class, I'll read you the big picture, what, what Luke's emphasis is, and so I'll read it again. Jesus, the Savior of the world, born as a prophet, preaches as a prophet, heals as a prophet, and dies as a prophet, all according to God's divine plan. In Mark, several weeks ago, Mark portrays the gospel of Mark, the good news about Jesus Christ, as something a little new, as a, a reveal, not as part of the old, but something new and, and, and different and radical, which it is. There's no question about that. Luke leans more towards Jesus being a part of God's plan and a part of the history of the Jews and of the world. And, and so it's a little different twist on the life of Jesus as Luke reports it differently than Mark reports it. And, uh, and obviously, you know, and we'll see again today and henceforth, that Luke regards Jesus as not only the Savior of the Jews, but the Savior of the world. And we'll see that immediately. <clears throat> We're in chapter 7. Central character of this story is a Roman centurion um, who has a servant whom he loves and values who's dying. And he knows of Jesus. What does that show? That shows that Jesus is becoming a little famous. If centurions know about Jesus, it, it's not a secret anymore. Uh, he's not in some remote village in Galilee. Uh, even the Romans know about him. And uh, this story uh, does not come uh, from Mark. It's repeated in Matthew, which we'll look at next summer. And it, but it comes from Q, which is another source. Not from Mark, not from the Hebrew Bible, which we don't have, and not, but from Q, which we really don't have either. But it's the same story um, that, that Matthew will see in recites and Luke, but not Mark. So who is a centurion? He's a Roman officer, not a general, but maybe a colonel. He commands a hundred uh, soldiers. That's why he's called a centurion. And in a legion, which is the largest unit of the Roman army, uh, there are probably 5,600 soldiers. So he's a big shot. He's heard of Jesus, which attests to Jesus' fame spreading. And Jesus goes to him to heal the servant uh, whom the centurion loves, which is a signal from Luke to us that Jesus has come not for the Jews, because guess what? The centurion is not a Jew. He's a Gentile. And Jesus, right away in chapter 7, is going out at the bequest of a centurion to heal the um, Gentile um, servant of a Gentile army officer. Um, now Jesus, the next story um, in 11 and 12, um, we have a widow who um, was the only son uh, of his mother, and Jesus feels sorry for his mother, and heals this son, this beloved son and only son uh, of this mother. Jesus touches a corpse to heal this person. That doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but if you're a, a Jew, the ritual law prohibits you from touching a corpse. And Jesus doesn't even think twice, just violates and continues to violate uh, the uh, ritual law of uh, what a Jewish man is supposed to do. Um, the interesting thing is that your Bible probably says, quoting Jesus when he touches this dead uh, young man, uh, it says, I say to you, get up. That's what Jesus says. That's probably what your Bible says. That is wrong. That is not a great translation of the Greek. A proper translation is be raised by God. It's a little more impactful, I would say. 
Jesus is saying, at the very least, I am a conduit of the most holy, and at the very most, I am God. It's a little more impactful, I would say. Um, we now have the story of John the Baptist, according to Luke, um, is uh, linked to Elijah. We'll rem I'll remind you that Elijah, from the Hebrew Scripture, the Old Testament, was the most beloved prophet. Also, the Jews loved Elijah because Elijah didn't die. Elijah was taken up alive into heaven never died. Um, and we have in 718, a very kind of strange story about John. Disciples of John reported all these things to him, all that Jesus was doing. Um, just above that, I'll remind you that in 16 it says, a great prophet has risen among us. Um, the disciples of John reported all these things to him, so John summoned Two of his disciples, why two? Why it takes two in two. order to be true. You're a Jew, you have to have the testimony of two men. Go figure. Then, two figured men to, to make it valid. So he sends two men, sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or do you have to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, go and tell John. And then Jesus gives these two men his resume. He says, here's my resume. Tell them what, I, what you've done. The blind have received their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. Deaf hear. Death are raised. Poor give. And when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. And this is a great short section of where Jesus tells us what Jesus thinks about John. This isn't coming from Mark or from Luke or from Matthew or from anybody else. This is really coming out of Jesus' mouth. So this isn't filtered. It's not secondhand. Um, and he asks three times, uh, what did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who put on fine clothing and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? Three times he asks. A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you? Exodus 23. He quotes Exodus. Jesus quotes. Jesus quotes the Bible. Isn't that nice? <laughs> uh, I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. Mm. Interesting. Maybe not even Mary. Think about it. No one is greater than John, yet the least in the kingdom of God are greater than he. Uh, all the people who heard this, including the tax collectors, acknowledged the justice of God because they had been baptized with John's baptism. But by refusing to be baptized by him, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. That's all in that's like a comment. It's all in brackets. Um, interesting. So these two guys come. They hear the word directly from Jesus, and then Jesus testifies about John to his followers. Pretty interesting. What's even more interesting, and this is seems to be a technique in Luke, kind of bothers me a little bit. What did John say when the two guys got back? He didn't, I mean, you'd think we'd have his end John saying, Yahoo! My life is not in vain, or I'm not waiting any longer. Nothing. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. Luke does this. One of his things. Um, we hear no response whatsoever. But we know from Jesus' mouth that John is the best that the human race can offer. And the way I think about John, and I think it's right, um, not perfectly right, but right, if you have watched the Olympics 
and you see for days and weeks before the Olympics start, people carrying the torch and handing it off to another person and another and another, and finally someone coming in to the place where the Olympics are going to occur and lighting the torch. That's what John was. John was carrying the torch. And John was carrying the torch for Jesus Christ. He was, his role is dependent on the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, but greater than all humans. The torch bearer. How about the next sentence? <laughs> How about my next sentence? Lord. Um, <clears throat> Jesus is human. This proves it. If we ever doubt that Jesus is human, there's two things in our lesson today that prove that Jesus is human. This is the first one. And I'll say, and I'll say after I read this to you, Jesus is frustrated. Jesus evidence anxiety. He's frustrated. To what then will I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the food for you, and you did not dance. The most uplifting thing that happens in the life of a first century Palestinian Jew is the wedding feast, where the flute is played, and people dance, and eat, and drink, and party for seven days. And that's all they do. And that's the best it gets in, in their lives. We wailed and you did not weep. The worst that it gets in their lives is when someone dies. And that's when people wail. So Jesus is saying, we had the wedding and you didn't dance. And we had the funeral and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he has a demon. The son of man, I have come, Jesus says, Come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus is saying, John comes, you didn't listen to him. I've come, you didn't listen to me. The, the wedding feast occurs, and you don't dance. Somebody dies, and you don't weep. What is the matter with you people? Don't you get it? This is, this is a, an outburst of frustration from Jesus. You'll never hear this in a sermon. Because it's a parable that is one of the hardest. Uh, we did parables last summer, and this was one of the ones we did, and it's one of the hardest. So you'll never hear a sermon on it. And even if you do, it's not a particularly happy sermon. <laughs> because Jesus is just showing frustration, human frustration. And then, interesting, nevertheless, and I'm not sure it has a lot to do with what I just said, but it follows. Nevertheless, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Wisdom is an attribute of God here and in the Hebrew scripture. Wisdom. And wisdom is always, always, always feminine. Never masculine. This is an attribute of God. I'll say it again. Wisdom is an attribute, ultimately an attribute of God, and it's never given as a masculine in the masculine. It's always feminine. So when you say, he God, which you know we're trying to get away from because it's not right. Um, from the beginning, this attribute of God is one of feminism, one of the feminine. Um, and then we have a story where a Pharisee invites Jesus to eat with him, and some woman shows up for dinner uninvited, and she's probably a prostitute. She's certainly not a woman of high standing in the community like the Pharisee. She's not educated, and she's referred to as a sinful woman. Woman. This is unique to Luke. It's not in any other gospel. And so the uh, Pharisee invites him. This woman shows up, and let me see if I can find it here. And a woman in the city, I'm in uh, 737 here, yeah. Who was a sinner, probably a prostitute, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, shows up uninvited, brought an alabaster jar of ointment, 
She stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what kind of woman this is, and that is who has been touching him, that she is a sinner, probably a prostitute. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, that's his name, I have something to say to you. Teacher replied, speak. And then we have a little story. A certain creditor had two debtors, one owning one owed 500 denarii and another one 50. 500 denarii is two years salary and another and, and 50 is two months salary. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both. Now, which one of them loved him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, gotcha. Jesus said, you are judged rightly. This is one of Jesus' tricks. He gets people to testify against themselves, and they don't even know they're doing it. And other, other humans in history have done this. Uh, Benjamin Franklin did it. A lot of people who tried to convince people that they were right and someone else was incorrect used their own words against them, kind of tricked them into this sort of circumstance. Then turning toward the woman, he said to the Pharisee, you see this woman, I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears. tears. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, streetwalker, have been forgiven, hence she has shown great love. But to the one to whom little is given, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table who uh, with him began to say amongst themselves, who is this who forgives sins? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus is saying to this woman, your sins are forgiven. And the, and the others, the Pharisees are saying, wait a minute, only God can forgive sins. This guy, what is he saying? Um, and he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Pretty interesting story. Pretty interesting story. Um, so let me give you my comments. The Pharisee gives nothing. The woman learned where Jesus was, brought ointment, wept, washed, wiped, kissed, and anointed. The Pharisee did nothing. And the woman was a sinner, and the Pharisee was this exalted, holy person. Um, in 47, it says, for many sins have been forgiven. Think about the tense. Jesus doesn't forgive her sins at that moment. That's not what he's saying. He says, and maybe the Pharisees misunderstood, or those listening, or us. He says, your sins have been forgiven in the past. And that because you have turned away from your life of sin and have become a follower of mine, your sins are forgiven, or forgiven, and because your sins are forgiven, you are now living a life of grace, and you're doing all the things you did. It's a little different than the way it reads. If you pay a little attention to the... I'm not saying um, what I'm telling you is absolutely correct. I'm just saying it's a different way to look at it, and I think it's an interesting way to look at it. Her sins were already forgiven, and she was living out a life of grace by taking care of Jesus as she did. And as the Pharisee didn't do. So um, I mentioned earlier, and I'm sorry this is a little bit out of uh, out of order, but we, we understood that John the Baptist didn't he didn't hear John's response to what Jesus said to his two disciples. Um, the Good Samaritan story, think about the Good Samaritan story. We have a priest, Jewish priest, and a Levite, and neither helped the man who was injured on the path and we don't know what happened to them whether they became followers of Jesus or not. Think about the prodigal son. What happened to the brother, the older brother? What, did the older brother come to the party? Or his younger brother who would come home? Did he not come to the party? A week later did he say, oh dad, now I get it. I get, I'm sorry. I acted out poorly. Or did he continue to mope and grope around about how he wasn't loved enough? We don't know. 
And Luke doesn't tell us. And I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. <coughs> but um, when I get there, I'm going to find out how these stories ended. <laughs> And I'll be, I'll be happy. In Luke 8, uh, Jesus' uh, missionary work is resumed. Um, we have, somewhat unique to Luke, an emphasis, particularly here and throughout Luke, more than any other gospel writer, an emphasis on women. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. There were 12 with him, we know that, as well as some women, who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others. Who provided for them out of their resources? Not only are these women followers, but they're providing for the whole group. They're paying for the twelve, the needs, the food, the housing, whatever they need, and for Jesus. And so they are apostles. These women are critical to the mission of Jesus. And here, in first century Palestinian words, we see Luke saying that they are as important to Jesus as are the twelve. Pretty interesting. And Luke is very big on the role, the important role of women in the mission, uh, the mission of Jesus Christ. I kind of like that. Don't you think the cross Jesus felt that way? Yes, I do. But, but Luke emphasizes it. Mm -hmm. First century Palestinians were not exactly as receptive as we are to that kind of thought. But Luke's maybe not a Jew. You don't know exactly who Luke was. He might not have been a Jew. But he's, he, he let it go. He said it and wrote it and broadcasted it. Kind of like that. <clears throat> um... So here we are now in with the sower of, of the seeds. Oh, the only thing I want to mention about women. Big events in the life of Jesus. His death, his burial, the empty tomb, and the resurrection. Four things. Only women were present at all four. Only women. Not Peter, not John, not James. Only women. Pretty interesting. Kind of like that. The, um, the passage that you read about the, the women who were apostles, is that in any other gospel? It's, yeah, um, I think Mark, and less so Matthew, regard women okay, mm -hmm. but Luke raises women up, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think he's the only one that says that the women were actually supporting the mission. Pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that. Uh, particularly coming out of first century Palestine. Right. Yeah. I mean, you expect it today, but not then. I don't know. So this 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 whole next little story, which you've heard maybe a hundred yeah. times or ten times, <laughs> the sower of the seed. Think of a guy with a bag of seed throwing seed out, and the seed lands on good substances, and it does great, and on with weeds, and it doesn't, and hard serve, it doesn't do well. The seed's the word of God. And a normal return on seed is, in Palestine, you'd say, good harvest, seven and a half times. Pound of seed, seven and a half pounds of harvest. Seven and a half fold would be a good harvest. What does Jesus say? A hundredfold. I mean, Jesus is really making a point here. This is when seed falls on good soil a hundredfold compared to a good harvest of seven and a half, this, somebody might say this is hyperbole. This is an extreme statement as heard by a first century Palestinian. And Luke does this and talks about something that's really hard for me, which is um, correct hearing. Correct hearing. I'll explain. Um, to you, it has been, <clears throat> Jesus says, to you it has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He's addressing his inner circle. 
In Mark, we had an inner circle and an, everyone outside the circle, and we understand we're outside the circle. And the inner circle is referred to a lot in Mark, not so much in Luke, but this is a reference to the inner circle. The inner circle received the mysteries of the kingdom of God from Jesus. Maybe Luke, I mean, definitely the apostles, maybe Paul, probably Paul, and a few others, the inner circle. And for everyone else, we get, we get parables, some of which are easy, some of which Jesus explains, some of which are hard, Jesus sort of half explains, and others that we have no clue really what they mean. They're so hard. And why is it so hard? I don't know. Uh, Luke quotes Isaiah 6, 9, implying that the parables either afford or obstruct vision depending on the sympathy um, of the hearers. In other words, Edward, one of my resources, says, to understand about Jesus Christ, you need to hear correctly. You need to be good soil. You need to hear correctly. That's what this parable is about, correct hearing. And um, productivity of the seed depends on how the word of God is heard. Right hearing leads to faith. Correct hearing leads to faith, and faith leads to action consistent with the word of God. Jesus said, I'm here to make you right with God, to reconcile all of you with God. Um, um, you are justified before God. Paul says justification. You are righteous before God, even though you're not. I made you righteous just because of my birth, life, death, and resurrection. And then now you need to believe what I say, what Jesus says. What is faith? Believing what Jesus says. That's what faith is. And in response to that faith, you need to live a life of action, which is called sanctification by Paul in Romans, which is very difficult. It's called sanctification. It's a life that reflects your appreciation for what Jesus has done for you. Taking care of others, using your resources well, taking care of others, looking out after your family, whether you like them or not, <laughs> uh, looking out after your friends, looking out at people you aren't friends with, whether you like them or not, and doing all of them. So this is an admonition, not in Matthew and not in Mark, about correct hearing. And, you know, it's hard because here I am telling you stuff, and I hope I'm telling you the right thing, and I hope you're hearing it the right way. I pray about that. Uh, Edwards, one of my guys, says, the word of God, Bible study, must be engaged, weighed, pondered, heard, learned, and remembered. Whew, makes me tired. And so that's kind of the hard, the deep part of today, is that the good news of Jesus Christ must be correctly heard and incorporated into your being. Something for you to ponder. Um, we now have in 19 Jesus joining his mother and brothers and sisters, who are mentioned. Um, and fortunately for us, we have a little better story here. Mary and Jesus' brothers are more like part of his follow, part of his following than we saw in Mark. And Mark, we saw his family looking at him like he lost his mind and treating him like he lost his mind. Here, Luke uh, says that implies in a more neutral fashion that uh, these this mother, Mary, and brothers and sisters were part of the family of Jesus Christ, the extended family of Jesus Christ. Um, nice, I like it better. Um, we now have in 22 the apostles in the boat out on the Sea of Galilee, which I reminded you is seven miles by nine miles, kind of shaped like a heart and about seven or eight hundred feet below sea level. Sort of, have you been to the Sea of Galilee? Sort of Trump? Mm -hmm. Trump mm -hmm. And the mountains, probably Mount Hermon, uh, which surround the Sea of Galilee are as high, the peaks are as high as 10,000 feet. You got a lot of And so the cold air from the mountains, way up 10,000 feet, meets with the warm air six or seven or eight hundred feet below sea level, which is warm, warm, and moist, moist, with this dry area, and within an hour you can go from calm 
to this incredible storm on the Sea of Galilee then, since, and now, because of these confluents, <clears throat> hot and cold air. And that's what happened. And it comes, you know, you can put out in a boat, it is nine miles long and seven miles wide, so you can be two or three miles out, and it's calm as can be, and within a half an hour or an hour, you can have this incredible, incredible turbulence and violence. And that's what we have. The apostles are scared to death. Kind of reminds me of Jonah. Same thing happened with Jonah. Jonah's sleeping and 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 calms the storm through the power and asks God to calm the storm. What's the difference here? No one asks God to calm the storm. Who calms the storm? Jesus. 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 And so what is Jesus doing? Jesus is doing what only God can do. Um, and 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 here we have um, Jesus doing that. And at the end, the apostles are scared, frightened, and they say, who is this man? And the story ends. And I go, mm. <laughs> Luke again. But in 26, we have the same story from uh, Mark about the demoniac. This guy lives uh, in an area where there are tombs. He lives in a cemetery. And he's possessed. And he runs around naked and they try and chain him and he breaks the chains. And it's kind of a bad scene. Um, and in this scene, uh, when Jesus shows up, when the, when the, um, the man was possessed, sees Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, what do you have to do with me? This is the demoniac speaking through the man. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High? We go from who is this man to guess who answers the question? A demon. I mean, you gotta, I mean, you gotta like that. The apostles, the closest people to Jesus, saying, I don't get it, who is this guy? And a demon answering the question. The answer is a little Gentile because they say, Son of the Most High God. Well, if this is the Most High God, there are less high gods. So that's polytheism. Polytheism is is not Jewish. It's Gentile. It's Roman. It's Hellenistic. It's not Jewish. So the answer of the demons is kind of, I'm not a Jewish demon. I'm a Gentile demon because <laughs> I have that point of view of the world of many gods. Um, I beg you, do not torment me, for Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit, come out of the man. Jesus said, then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion. Remember I told you a little earlier that the centurion was the head of a hundred guys, and the biggest group of Roman soldiers was a legion. And it's 5,600 soldiers. And this guy was saying, I'm lots of demons. And he says, I'm a legion. He's saying, I'm 5,600 demons. Uh, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not um, him not to order them to go back into the abyss. The abyss is the, the realm as we understand it, the realm of the dead or the place where demons go. It's a Greek word. Uh, it means the place of the dead. So we have uh, Jesus. <laughs> This is, this is not as shocking to us as it would be if you were a first century Jew. This story is about an unclean demon with a man with an unclean spirit among unclean tombs where dead people are, where Jews can't touch them or be around them, surrounded by people in unclean occupations in Gentile territory. So Jesus is breaking every norm by being there, by healing this guy, by his very presence is like shocking. And it's another message that Jesus, and not only the Jews, according to Luke, but for the whole world. And this is about as bad as it gets. Um, again, the locals, how do they react? They should say, 
Oh, the Messiah's come, thank God. They react in fear, not faith. The healed man reacts correctly and says, can I be a follower of yours? And what does Jesus say? No, you can't. <laughs> say, what? That's not very Jesus-like. Why might Jesus have said no? This guy was a Gentile. And if he takes them back to, to, to where the Jews live in Palestine, they're, the Jews are going to say, what are you doing with a Gentile in your following? And it might impact Jesus in the whole worse than if he's not a follower. So Jesus says no. That's the only explanation I can give you. I had a gal. Let's go ahead. I bet the gal was going to help spread the word. In the Gentile. Yeah. Maybe. Back in the Gentile. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe. But I don't think Jesus at this stage could afford when he's going back to Jerusalem to have a Gentile with him. But he would have been a great witness because everybody was terrified of him. And then he, and he was, was terrifying. Yes. Running around naked in tombs, you know, and screaming pigs, and yelling and pigs too. And and unclean pigs, pigs are around. And, and, and that's what the, that's what the reference is to unclean activities. I mean <laughs> Jews. These guys raise pigs for a living. I mean, come on. Um, so that's a that's a that's a extreme story. Very extreme. But Luke again is saying Jesus came not only for the Jews, but even for this terrible situation with Gentiles, for the whole world. In 40, we have uh, Jairus, the president of the synagogue. Don't forget the synagogue is not a place to worship God. The synagogue is the place to hear about and be taught about Scripture and God. And this guy is not a priest. He doesn't lead worship or prepare sacrifices He's more like a holy man business manager. And he has a child who is very, very sick. His only daughter, she's dying. Um, and he calls for Jesus to come, to come back and heal the daughter. And before Jesus gets there, the daughter dies. And then the story stops. And then on the way, we have a woman, the little girl's 12 years old. We have a woman who is following Jesus as Jesus is transposing himself to transporting himself to the house of Jairus to look at the daughter, who touches Jesus' clothes, just barely touches his clothes. And she'd been she had had hemorrhage, she was hemorrhaging, bleeding, and she'd been bleeding for 12, 12 years. years. The little girl was 12. I don't know. I'm just saying it's a, it's a coincidence. And Jesus, when the woman touches him, says, who touched me? And two interesting things about that. The first one is obvious. Jesus realizes that healing power has gone out of him, and this woman is healed. And he didn't even say or do anything. He didn't pray. He didn't ask God for help. He didn't do anything. This woman just touched him, and she was healed. That's, that's sort of... A little startling, right? Are you a little startled? Mm -hmm. This is the most startling thing. This was the second reference to Jesus' humanity. When he said, who touched me? The, tr the translation for my point is, which man touched me? Who is the masculine? When Jesus says this in the Greek, who, which man touched me? Because, thanks to Luke, we know a woman touched him. Jesus doesn't. We know this ahead of Jesus. We know before Jesus knows that this is a woman. That's sort of interesting, isn't it? Jesus, you know, we talk about Jesus' humanity. So sometimes we have a hard time with Jesus' humanity. But here's an instance where Jesus defers to the masculine because he doesn't know whether it's a man or a woman. And we know because of Luke. I think that's sort of interesting. So she's healed, and now we go back to Jairus' daughter. We have this little interlude, the woman uh, who had been bleeding for 12 years, who's now cured. <clears throat> and who goes with Jesus in to see the little girl? None other than Peter, James, John, the inner circle, always in that order. Always in that order, unless James has been martyred. You see James last, so it'll say Peter, John, and James. That means James has been martyred. 
when it's written and that reference is given. We'll see it. We'll see later. Um, Mark says that the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years spent all of her money on doctors and didn't get any better. In fact, she got worse. Luke doesn't say that. He omits that little comment. Why? Because Luke is a doctor. No <laughs> <laughs> wonder. Dr. Luke. Is there. <laughs> Dr. Luke. Uh, in chapter 9, um, the apostles are endowed with Jesus' authority to participate as agents. and give, They're given power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. Um, in 10, we have the feeding of the 5,000 men, which means there's probably, they could be 11 or 12,000 people. You count women and children as well. They're all out in the field. Jesus is, is, um, is testifying to them about the kingdom of God. Uh, this miracle is the only miracle in all four Gospels. It's so incredibly amazing. That's probably true. And it's almost certainly true. It's in all four Gospels. If it hadn't been true, some Gospel writer would have left it out. And so we have this incredible um, uh, situation. And Jesus, uh, where five loaves and two fish feed 5,000 men and, how, and maybe an equal number of women and children in all four Gospels. And Jesus uh, says to the crowd, who do you say I am? And, and then the crowds don't answer, but who answers? Peter answers. For the first time, the anointed one of God. And so here we have the first disciple acknowledging that Jesus is the anointed one of God in this gospel. Pretty interesting. Um, the Old Testament says that the Messiah is going to be the following, colon, a perfect king chosen by God for eternity in the line of David, a son of David, who would deliver Israel from its enemies, Rome at the time, and bring in a peace of tranquility, bring in a time of peace and tranquility where the um, Jewish empire is reestablished as it was in the days of David and Solomon. That's who the Messiah was supposed to be. That's who the Jews understood the Messiah would be. And maybe when Peter says that, he may be thinking that's that's what Jesus is going to be. Peter wasn't all the way here, all the way to the end of what Jesus really was. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, would you say that again, what the Messiah <laughs> was supposed to be? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll read it this time to get it <laughs> yeah. uh, The Messiah would be the perfect king chosen by God from eternity. Through whom, through whom God would deliver Israel from its enemies to a time of peace and tranquility. So here, I didn't tell you that, just be pedantic. Here we have 5,000 men out in the wilderness hearing about Jesus. He is referred to as the son of David by these people. Some of these people are zealots, which means that they're revolutionaries, they're terrorists against the Roman Empire. Later, before uh, Herod, before uh, Pilate, Jesus is referred to as the king of the Jews. And this expectation of a military general is fed by these people out in the wilderness, some of whom are zealots, calling Jesus the son of David in the line of David and king of the Jews, and the Romans are not happy. The only thing the Romans require, they don't care what you say or do or who you believe and what God you believe, but they don't want you to conflict with them. They want absolute control over you. They don't want revolutionaries. They don't want the king of the Jews. They don't want any competing power structures against them. And so Jesus is aware of this. And we'll see it, uh, how Jesus tries to tamp this down and say, 
I'm not going to be a general. I'm not going to ride a white horse. I'm not going to lead legions of soldiers against the Romans. And you'll see that he's aware of it, but the Romans are aware of it, and the Jew, the, the Sanhedrin and the Jews that are against Jews play into that when they make their case to have Jesus crucified. Uh, in 27, we have this very difficult verse that people say, it's, it's that from the mouth of Jesus, and they say, well, Jesus was probably wrong. A lot of academics say Jesus, when he said this, it turned out to be wrong. You know that I'm not going to like that, right? <laughs> so this is what it says. Jesus says, I tell you truly that there are some of these who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And the scholars say the kingdom of God comes fully when Jesus, the second coming, the end of times, parousia, and that didn't happen, and they all died, and we were all had deaths, that we, and it's still not happened. And therefore, Jesus was wrong. That's what they say. And, you know, I'm not a scholar, but some of the scholars say that. I, on the other hand, have a different read. And my read is that Mark and Luke intended, when they said this, the coming of the kingdom to be the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. With the resurrection of Jesus and the presence of Jesus on earth comes the kingdom of God. And Jesus, in my opinion, take it if you wish or not, is saying, when I am resurrected, the kingdom is here. The Holy Spirit will come, and the kingdom of God, not fully realized, but the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that's what he's saying here. I like it better than some of the other. Um, and it said right before the transfiguration on the mountain. So, I mean, they, they the three, Yes. are going to get to see uh, a touch of, of the veil pull back and yes. see part of heaven. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So in 928, thank you for that lead-in, <laughs> uh, eight, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him, I'll make a guess. Peter James <laughs> um, and, and by this time, James may have been martyred. Because mm. it's not Peter, James, and John anymore. It's Peter, John, and James. Oh, no. We don't know. It's just a theory. Went up to the mountain, probably Mount Hermon, 10,000 feet, I told you, around the lake. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah. Moses brought the law, and Elijah was the uh, favorite prophet, ancient prophet of Israel who didn't die, was taken to heaven alive, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, Jesus' death, which he was now about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were way down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Peter is derided for this statement. They make some people make fun of Peter for saying this. Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three dwellings, houses, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. P.S. Certainly Moses doesn't need a house, and certainly Elijah doesn't need a house. <laughs> and probably not Jesus either. I'll come back, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. We know what that means. Who appears in a cloud? Yeah, I know that. The cloud comes over you and you start hearing a voice. Mm -hmm. You may be shaking in your boots, <laughs> whether you're wearing boots or not. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said to him, this is my son. Some of you come Tuesday nights, previously it's over now, at six o'clock, and, and hear a show and talk about a show called what? Chosen. God said, this is my son, my chosen. Oh, so now we know where that comes from. My chosen, 
Listen to him. Listen to him. What did I tell you faith was? Listening. Faith is listening to Jesus and believing what Jesus says. That's all. Yeah. Not anything more common. Not some philosophical thing that you studied when you were in college. Listening to Jesus and believing what he says. That's all. That's all. Pretty simple. Yeah. Pretty simple. Yeah. When the voice was spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. And those days told no one of any of these things they had seen. So who reported this? They didn't tell anybody. Who reported this? Yeah. Had to be Peter or John. I would say Peter or John, because we think maybe James is not reporting anything anymore. <laughs> and, um, probably not Jesus. He had other things on his mind, for sure. So probably Peter. Probably Peter. Luke um, probably traveled with Peter, and Peter probably told him. Um, the Transfiguration, this is called. This is a, some people say, it's a hinge in Jesus' life. It's a hinge. It's a divide. It's the great continental divide before the Transfiguration and after the Transfiguration. Probably true. It's certainly a big deal. Um, so let me go back to Peter being derided and wanting to build houses for uh, Moses and uh, <laughs> the correct translation of the word is the word here is um, what do we call it here dwellings or houses, it's probably not the right word probably the right word is tabernacle yeah. when big stuff when big stuff happens in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture, which is the right name for the Old Testament, when big things happen involving God and confrontations with God or God appearing or God advising, the Jews built like a statue. They called it a tabernacle. And they did that to commemorate a place where God came to earth and interacted with human beings. And I think that's what Peter is saying. Mm -hmm. This is a Peter saying, this is a big deal. I get it. And maybe we ought to commemorate this on Mount Hermon that this happened here so that people in future generations will know that these two uh, uh, beings and God came here uh, to be with humans on earth. Maybe that's, I like that story better than making fun of poor Peter. I don't like that part. Um, let's see here. Um, we have now, kind of, kind of watch my time. We have a man with his only son that, that has epilepsy. We don't know that from Mark or Luke, but we know it from Matthew. He has epilepsy. And the, the disciples couldn't heal him, and Jesus heals him. And then we hear the second prediction of Jesus' death, with no actual mention of crucifixion or resurrection, uh, which is different from Mark and Matthew. But again, we see it. The disciples fight amongst themselves about who is the greater, and, um, and Jesus doesn't like that, as you can imagine. Yeah. And... Um, this ends with Jesus saying, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me. Do not stop this child for whoever is not against me is for me. We have a statue that you may have seen in the garden. And it's Jesus with a child. And from a 21st century human being's viewpoint, we say, oh, we love children. We relish children. We spoil our children. We give them things they shouldn't need or want. And we how old children in very high regard. That's our viewpoint. First century Palestine, completely different, was high child um, mortality. Sometimes people say more than 50% of all children die before their second birthday. They had no value. They just took resources and didn't work. And so they were held in pretty low regard. That comes as a shock to 21st century yeah. people who love children and value the the family unit, and the concept of family. But from when Jesus is saying, 
let the children come to me, he's saying more than just children. He's saying those who have no power, those who have no worth in your eyes, those who are oppressed, those who are poor, those who are sick. That's what he's really saying. So when you look at that statue, yes, children, but children as a symbol of the powerless, the disenfranchised, and the poor, and the weak. That's what Jesus is really saying. Let them come to me. Um, in 49, we have John on his solo gig. Nowhere else does John appear by himself. John, John has a question, and he's, he's it's sort of a strange question. Um, only Peter appears by himself. We don't know that much about the apostles. We really don't. From Other than from Holy Scripture, we know that the apostles, we think, uh, 10 of the 11 remaining after Judas were murdered. 10 of the 11 were murdered, you think. Mm -hmm. So they did not, their, their fellowship was not an easy one. And, 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 um, and we have a story about fellowship here. John does make a little misstatement. He says, I'm mad at these people because they're not following us. Wait a minute. This isn't about you, John. This is about Jesus, not you, John. Um, and but it shows that even early, early, early on in Christianity, there are people who are driving out demons from people who aren't Jesus or an apostle. There are others, and there's a conflict among early Christians about false prophets. And already, before Jesus is even crucified, we have false prophets, false Christian prophets. We're saying, follow me and don't follow Jesus. Or I, I speak for Jesus when they don't. It's pretty interesting. And it continues for hundreds of years. Um, we're not aware of that because it's not so much going on now. No one, not, not too many people say, Jesus said, I'm the one. We don't have anybody saying that right now, I don't think. But back then it was a big deal. Um, starting at 951. We have 10 chapters that are unique to Luke. They're not from Mark, they're not from Q, they're not from anybody. They're only Luke. They're L for Luke. And it's the travel narrative, the middle section, uh, the mission of Jesus as the way of salvation. And it's referred to as the way. And this is the first time we see that terminology. Early Christians for the first few hundred years were referred to as the way of Jesus, not Christians. They're referred to as the way, and that's where this comes from. Where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm at the end of nine. nine. Okay. I think yeah. you said where it started. 951 is where this starts. Oh, okay. It's kind of, it's, it probably should be a new chapter, but whatever. <laughs> we, can, we can deal with it. Um, it begins a new section where Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. Oh, okay. He's, uh, 51 says he sets his face um, and the days drew near for him to be taken up. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is this is the beginning of the trip to Jerusalem. Um, and it's referred to as the way. Now we have a story where some Samaritans are not behaving properly, and James and John asked Jesus if they should bring fire down on these people. <laughs> Pretty funny. Uh, Elijah did that. Elijah did bring fire down on people, and so they're quoting from Elijah. I also think it's funny that James and John are known as the sons of thunder, <laughs> and they want to know if they should bring fire down on people. And Jesus says, not the best idea, guys. Um, then we have three conversations about follow ship, and it's interesting. Um, 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, someone unidentified, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another uh, said, uh, then he said to another, Follow me. But that other person said, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. 
But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Not the literal dead, the spiritual dead. That's what he means. But the spiritual dead bury the spiritual dead. I, have, I can have nothing to do with them. Another said, I will follow you. I will follow you, I will follow you, I will follow you. The third one, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. A little bit of an overstatement. This is about fellowship. Jesus is saying, this isn't going to be easy. Following me is not going to be easy. He's telling his apostles that. And guess what? Nine of the ten of them are murdered. That's the definition of not easy. <laughs> and guess what? He's telling us the same thing. It's not going to be easy necessarily. There are going to be some bumps in the road in following me. And I'm telling you now so that you're not surprised. So, yes, there are bumps in the road. Life can be unfair. Life can be tough. But Jesus is telling us that. But he's also saying, I will be with you always. I will be with you no matter what happens to you. Which is nice. Um, and I think that's the end of the lesson for today. Next week, uh, we're going to... By the way, we have four more lessons. If I last that long, um, <coughs> finishing at the beginning of October. Next week, we'll see parables, some of which are unique to Luke about money and wealth. Luke's big on proper resourcing, money and wealth. We'll see the source of infant baptism. We'll see the camel that goes through the eye of the needle or can't go through. Uh, we'll find out how tall a sycamore tree is meet Zacharias and find out um, whether Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on one donkey or two donkeys. Oh, really? We're going to find that all out. Next week. And bread. We're going to have a big week next week. I hope you can come or if not, you will be on Zoom. Any questions? Comments? Alternative points of view? You know, I think it's... Uh, Interesting, like you say, some people make fun of Peter about his comment at the Transfiguration, but they were heading toward Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in the next couple of verses. So it would have been on their minds that, I mean, just like when Christmas is coming up, we know Christmas is right. coming up. It's the season. It's the season. So it was the season which tabernacles were a big celebration. Yep. So that would have been Thank on you. Peter's mind. So Thank you for that. That's it's correct. good to defend Peter. Yeah. <laughs> it never occurred to me that he was talking about a house and yeah. our dwelling. Yeah. I, did, I always thought like ark. It was going to be a commemoration. Well, then you were, right. you were right. You were not misled. Good for you. I'm this this crazy. <laughs> <laughs> crazy smart. She's crazy she's smart. That's what you are. She's crazy. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this time together. We pray that we would speak correctly and hear correctly so that we would become better, more perfect followers of your son. In the name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Doug. Thank you.